Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Tiffany Fellowship Church. Those of you who are here and those joining us online, I, I trust that uh, you're enjoying this uh, Thanksgiving week. If you have your Bibles, and you should, turn with me to two texts this morning. Uh, this is why God gave us two hands, for one for each text. Now, let me just say I normally do one text. Today I'm doing two. It's all going to be okay. Don't, don't panic. No, oh, don't be on overload. We'll do this. First text I want to talk about, I want to read this morning. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. You can put kind of one uh, hand, one finger there, and then flip over to Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. Two, two scripture texts this morning, they're so important, so relevant to each other that uh, we're going to uh, read both of those as our scripture text today. Uh, I, I continue today a series uh, called Not Negotiable. Not Negotiable. On the website, progressivechristianity.org, don't go there, uh, there is a drop-down menu called The Eight Points of Progressive Christianity. Now let me just read a couple of those eight points of progressive Christianity to you this morning. I'll read uh, uh, four or so, and you tell me what you think, what you discern when you read the statement of fundamental beliefs of progressive Christianity. Number one, they say, and I quote, we believe that following the path and teachings of Jesus can lead to an awareness and experience of the sacred and the oneness and the unity of all life. Number two, we affirm that the teachings of Jesus provide but one of many ways to experience the sacredness and oneness of life, and that we can draw from diverse sources of wisdom on our spiritual journey. Number three, we seek community that is all in that, that is inclusive of all people, including but not limited to conventional Christians and questioning skeptics, believers and agnostics, men and women, or excuse me, women and men, those of all sexual orientations and gender identities, and those of all classes and abilities. And then let me skip down to number five. We find grace in the search for understanding and believe there is more value in questioning than in absolutes. Let me read that last one again. We believe there is more value in questioning than absolutes. Now, when you read all eight of these, and I'm I'm not going to read all eight of them to you, but on first blush, at first appearance, sounds pretty harmless, right? Sounds kind and compassionate and inclusive. But listen, when you read through the progressive Christianity statement of fundamental beliefs, I will just tell you, there is no doctrinal belief about sin and salvation. Nothing is said about sin and salvation. Nothing is said about heaven or hell. Is Jesus the divine son of God? They just don't say. What about his death and resurrection? What about Jesus' claim to be the only way to God. What are we to do with that in progressive Christianity? They say a lot about the sacred and the oneness of unity of all life. Is that salvation? Is that their concept of heaven? And if questioning has more value than absolutes, what truth claims can we ever trust? Is there anything that we can firmly believe in if asking questions has more value than absolute truth? You see, friends, listen to me. Progressive Christianity offers no answers, only more questions and more doubt, more confusion, and more distortion. And in an attempt to be inclusive, non-confrontational, and not judgmental, progressive Christianity offers no guidelines, no guardrails, no boundaries, and no cautions at all. On the other hand, in their book, One Faith No Longer, authors George Yancey and Ashley Kwosik 
write, and I quote, after examining the data, we argue that the divide between theologically progressive and conservative Christians is so great that one can realistically think of them as completely different religious groups. Completely different religious groups. In other words, hear me, progressive Christianity is no Christianity at all. Now this series called Not Negotiable is a biblical response to the current crisis of the rise from within of the true enemy of the church of Jesus Christ, progressive Christianity. I just wish that those who are trying to redefine the historic Christian doctrine and belief would just make up their own religion, not call themselves Christian, start their own churches or their own temples or their own places of worship and not call themselves Christians because as these authors say, of one faith no longer. They're two completely separate groups. You see, you can call yourself a Christian and identify as a Christian, but there are, as Christians, some non-negotiables that we hold to and we must not compromise on. See, there's a, let me just say this. I'm not saying that every Christian everywhere has to believe exactly everything about the Bible in every last minute detail that I believe. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying there's a huge difference between denominational differences. How many of you know there's hundreds of different denominations? There's a huge difference between denominational differences and doctrinal defects. And so let me say this, we can agree to disagree over minor denominational differences, but we must break fellowship over doctrinal defects. I believe that's what the Bible teaches, and that's the gist of this series. We must break fellowship with those who believe defective doctrine about God and his word. There are just some beliefs that are non-negotiable. They're not negotiable. And I want to look at another one of them this morning. So if you'll stand with me, let's read the scripture. Again, ready? Two texts this morning. Crazy. We're getting crazy, Pastor Ray. Yes, I know. Two texts. We'll be okay. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 5. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. Let's hit the pause button. Paul's reminding us of the gospel he preached that we received and upon which we have taken our stand. He says, by this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Skipping down to verse 11. This is what we preach, and this is what you believed. This is what we preached, and this is what you believed. Now let's flip over to Galatians. Chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. Again, kind of continuing Paul's train of thought here. From 1 Corinthians 15 to Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody preaching to you is preaching to you a gospel other than the one you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? 
If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was, it ta- was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. This is God's word. Can you say amen? Thank you, God, for your word. I pray that you will help us to understand what this means and Help us to understand what the essence of the gospel is, that we would not compromise on this issue, that we would not desert the the gospel and turn to another. Help us, God, to understand, to obey, and to hold firm, as you said in this word, hold firm to the gospel that was preached to us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In the series, Not Negotiable, today's title, The Gospel's Power. The gospel's power is not negotiable. Last week we examined the first non-negotiable, the Bible's authority. We concluded that every word of the word is God's word. Even the words of the early Old Testament that were superseded by Christ, that Christ came to fulfill, that we are no longer bound to, still the word of God and we receive it as the word of God and Jesus said not a stroke of the pen will pass away. We concluded that every word of the word is God's word. We saw that the sole authority for our faith and the final authority for our conduct is the word of God, the inspired scriptures. We affirmed that God gave the inspiration. Jesus is the incarnation. The Holy Spirit gives the illumination and we make the application. Today, we turn our attention to the second belief that is non negotiable, not negotiable. In our text today, Paul says that the gospel is not negotiable. To change the gospel, Paul says, is to desert the gospel. To change the gospel is, a changed gospel is no gospel at all. And so over the next few minutes, I'm going to try to answer three questions about the gospel. Three questions about the gospel. Now let me say right up front, hear me out. I'm going to give you a lot of material today. Uh, There's just so much. And I tried to cut out as much as I could. But you can't add or or subtract from the gospel. And so I feel like to cut any more out would be to desert the gospel. So someone sent me an email this last week and they said to me, Pastor Barry, when I was taking notes on your message, they're an online viewer, and they said... I was writing so fast, smoke was coming up from my pen. Let me just say straight off the bat, I'm not a, I do not apologize for the material, but I'm going to tell you it's going to be a lot of it. It's going to come fast. And I make no apology about that. I encourage you to take notes, maybe take pictures of the screen. Listen to me. Email me and I will send you my manuscript. I have, no, I have no problem with doing that. Several people did that this weekend. This week I mailed them out. I think this, this is so good that you, you, should, you should study it several times. My wife and I had several discussions this week over the message. She brought some things back up and asked me questions. We went over some of the stuff again. That's okay. I know this is a lot of material. Let me say this. I want to intentionally overwhelm you with the volume of the truth of the gospel. This is so important. I want you to see it is voluminous and it is truthful in all of its volume. So are you ready? Let's put our running shoes on this morning. Three questions I want to ask and answer about the gospel. Number one, what is the gospel? Let's, let's ask the question and try to answer what is the gospel. And often I'll tell you Often we can understand what something is by, by really stating what it's not. So before I get into what the gospel is, let me, tell, let me maybe correct some faults and some misunderstandings that you might have about the gospel. And so let me tell you what the gospel is not. Very quickly, what the gospel is not. Some things the gospel is not. And we'll just go ahead and throw them all up on the screen. Four things the gospel is not. Perhaps this will challenge and correct your thinking. The gospel is not the whole Bible. Contrary to popular belief, and I heard some people say, I'm not going to give up on the gospel, and they hold up the whole Bible as if the whole Bible is the gospel. The the gospel is found in the Bible, but it's not simply the Bible. 
The Bible contains the gospel, okay? Secondly, belief in God is not the gospel. Some people believe that they are sharing the gospel by encouraging the belief in God, by pushing people into believing in God. That's a good place to start, but belief in God is not the result of the gospel. The devil and his demons believe in God, and they're going to spend eternity and forever in the lake of fire, okay? So believing in God is the gospel, preaching the gospel is not getting people to believe in God. Third, moral teaching. Moral teaching is not the gospel. Morality is good, but it's not the gospel. Islam teaches moralism. Jehovah's Witness teaches moralism. Buddhism is a moralistic religion, you know, karma, you do good things and good things come back to you, you do bad things and bad things come back to you, that's moralism. And moralism is, it produces better behavior, no doubt about it. Listen to me, moralism, moral teaching can produce better behavior, but the gospel produces total transformation. There's... It's infinitely better to be totally transformed than to just have better behavior, okay? So moralism is not the gospel. No, number four, good advice. Good advice. The gospel is good news, not good advice, <laughs> okay? Advice is often something we share with someone to help them out. Here, take this. It'll help, <laughs> Not feeling well? Try God. <laughs> Listen, the gospel isn't some advice. Okay, the gospel isn't some advice. It's the answer. The gospel isn't advice. It's, it's the answer. The gospel is not a suggestion. It's the solution. It's not a suggestion. It's, the, it's a solution. So that's what the gospel's not. Now let's turn our attention to what the gospel is. After saying what it's not, what, what is it? Paul tells us from these texts, and I'm gonna read several texts from, from Paul and also some from the other part of the Bible, but uh, several things that the gospel is. And let, let me go through them quickly. Tie, lace up your shoes, because here we go. I'm gonna overwhelm you with the gospel here. First of all, the gospel is of first importance. What it is, is it is of first importance. In chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, verse 3, for what I received, I pass on to you as, as of first importance. In fact, let me put it to you this way. Not only is the Bible, or the gospel of first importance, but I will say this, there is nothing more important in all the scripture than the gospel. It's of first importance. The gospel is of first, first importance. Remember I told you last week there are primary beliefs, there are secondary beliefs, and there are tertiary beliefs? Remember I told you that last week? The Bible, uh, the, the Bible is the inspired word of God. That is a primary belief. The gospel is one of those primary beliefs of first importance. Secondly, the gospel is from God, not mankind. The gospel is from God, not from mankind. Paul tells us in verses 11 and 12 of Galatians 1, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. Can I tell you right now that many of the religious systems in the world today come out of the mind of men? They're from men. Progressive Christianity itself is like the conjuring of something out of the mind of man. And Paul says, the gospel I preached didn't come from man. I, I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Listen to me. The gospel is God's story of salvation, not our story to change. It's God's story of salvation. Three, the gospel is prophesied in the Old Testament. And let me just say, this is one of the most powerful things about the gospel, is that it just, didn't, it just didn't come in the New Testament. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. Uh, look at what Paul says in Romans 1, verse 2. He says, the gospel he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The Old Testament, God's word, old and new, prophesies the gospel long before it became 
a, a reality it was prophesied. It's not new. It's not novel. It has always been God's plan. Give me that old time religion. That old time gospel, that historic, Bible based, never changing story of redemption. Okay? The gospel's from God, not mankind. It's of first importance. It's prophesied in the Old Testament. Third, the gospel is the good news of salvation. The good news of salvation. In fact, the word gospel in the original language comes from the word evangelism. I'm not even going to pronounce it in the Greek because I'll ruin it for you. But it's, it's the good news. It's, it's translated into English, good news, evangelism, the good news. The gospel is the good news of salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, 2, by the gospel you're saved. Romans 1, 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it, the gospel, is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel brings salvation. It's the power of God, the good news of salvation. Number four, the gospel is the substitutionary death of Jesus. Am I going fast enough for you? Because I can speed it up. The gospel is the substitutionary death of Jesus. Let me say two things about this. Please, if you're taking notes, write these down. These are important about the gospel. Number one, when we talk about the substitutionary death of Jesus, Jesus died as my substitute. That's what it means. Jesus died as my substitute. Isaiah 53, here's one of those Old Testament prophecies of the gospel. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. Surely he took up up our pain and bore our sufferings, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. Jesus died as my substitute. See, God is just, and so sin cannot go unpunished. Now see, this is the difference between Christian Christ, a historic Christianity, conservative Christianity, and progressive Christianity. In progressive Christianity, God ignores sin, or there's no such thing as sin. Everybody, no matter what, you can come to God. God will accept you. Everybody's equal. Doesn't matter what you do. God loves you. He forgives you. He, he, he loves you. And, and God's love is true, and God's love is pure. But listen to me. God is a just, he's not only a loving God, but he is a just God. And sin must be dealt with. Because a just God cannot go, oh, oh, oh that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Right? It's not okay. God is just, so sin cannot go unpunished. Progression, progressive Christianity sees Jesus' substitutionary death as cosmic child abuse. It's true. You, you can read it. They're like, I don't know why. It's just horrible that God would take his wrath out on his son, kill his son for somebody else's sin. That's child abuse. No mother or father, whatever. Listen, you, you can call it cosmic child abuse, or you can call it the divine, wonderful love of God that he would give himself as a substitute for my sin. Wow. It doesn't just ignore it. Oh, that's okay. You, okay, uh, I find that behavior detestable, but uh, oh well, oh well, oh well. Let me ask you a question. If there was any other way to heaven than through the death of Jesus, why would God the Father allow Jesus to suffer and be tortured and die? Think about it. If there are multiple ways, Jesus is only one way to God. If there are multiple ways to God, then why would God put Jesus through all that pain? You know why? One door. One way. It's the way of the cross. The way of suffering. There's not more than one. There's just one. Jesus died as my substitute. Number two, Jesus died as payment for my sin. Jesus died as payment for my sin. This is called atonement. He atoned 
for my sin. 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, friends, listen to me. Jesus paid with his blood for the offense to God that my sin caused. His death satisfied the justice of God. Let me say that again. Jesus paid with his blood for the offense to God that my sin caused. Jesus' death satisfied the justice of God. One of the major problems with progressive Christianity is it doesn't acknowledge that sin cannot go unpunished. Christianity affirms sin is bad, it's horrible in God's sight. It must be punished. And Jesus said, I'll take it. I will take on my back Barry's sin. What? I'll pay for it with my own blood. Oh, substitutionary death. Jesus died as my substitute. Jesus died as payment for my sin. Let's continue with what the gospel is. The gospel is received by grace and faith alone. The gospel is received by grace and faith alone. Verse 6 and 7 of Galatians 1. I'm astonished. Look at what Paul says. Again, this is straight out of our text. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. I'm astonished, Paul says. That you are, that, I'm astonished that you're deserting the one who called you to live in grace. See, listen, a move away from grace is a move away from the gospel. Let me say it again. A move away from grace is a move away from the gospel. Good works, social justice, intolerance, and inclusion it's not the gospel. It's just not the gospel. Jesus saves by grace through faith. That's the gospel. Let me say it again. Jesus saves by grace through faith. That is the gospel. That's the gospel. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 17. For in the gospel... The righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness, look at this, that is by faith from first to last. Always has been, always will be. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as this is written in the Old Testament, long ago in the Old Testament, the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will not live by works. The righteous will not live by their personal holiness. The righteous will live by faith in the grace of God to forgive their sins. Any gospel other than grace and faith is no gospel at all. Salvation has always been and always will be by grace and faith alone. All we have to do is accept it by faith. Not simple belief, but absolute belief. It is complete trust in God for our forgiveness, redemption, justification, and future glorification. There is no other way to salvation and to heaven than through the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is not one way. He is uh, the way. You know, it sounds similar, doesn't it? Jesus is a way, a pathway to God. And Jesus is the pathway to God. Sounds very, very similar. It's a small world, word, but it means a whole lot more than it seems. There's no other way to salvation and to heaven than through the gospel of Jesus. And finally, the gospel includes the physical resurrection of Jesus. The gospel includes the physical resurrection of Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. Again, in the same context of what the gospel is, he says, For what I receive, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Any gospel must include the resurrection. 
The physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus. Now listen, there's this concept in Gnostic Christianity, another form of progressive Christianity, that says that Jesus didn't physically or bodily resurrect, he spiritually resurrected. When when we come to faith in the goodness and the Christness of Jesus, he is resurrected inside of us. That's a doctrinal defect. We affirm that Jesus bodily and physically rose from the dead. That's the gospel. That's included in the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still dead in your sins. If he's not physically bodily rose from the dead, your faith is futile. You You shouldn't even call yourself a Christian. You shouldn't even think you're a Christian. Your faith in God is useless. Listen, friends, Jesus' death was the penalty for sin. Jesus' resurrection was the power over sin. We need both. We need Jesus to pay the penalty for sin, and we need Jesus to have power over sin and death and hell and the grave. The resurrection ensures that. Okay, the gospel includes the physical resurrection of Jesus. So this is what the gospel is Now let's turn our attention to the second question that I want to answer quickly. Why must it be held firmly? Why does Paul say the gospel must be held firmly? Let me give you very quickly, again, here we go, five reasons why the gospel must be held firmly. Number one, a different gospel introduces confusion. Look what Paul says in Galatians 1, 6 and 7. I'm astonished that you are so quickly turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion with a different gospel, throwing you into confusion. Listen, there's a satanic conspiracy to confuse the gospel. It's confusing. It introduces confusion. Secondly, a confused gospel becomes a perverted gospel. Verse 7, evidently some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel. Confuse you and pervert the gospel. A confused gospel becomes a perverted gospel. Number three, supernatural signs do not validate a false gospel. Now let me hit the pause button right here because this is really, really important. This is really, really important. Let's read the text. Verse 8 of Galatians 1, but even if we are an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. But an, but an angel, a supernatural sign came. An angel appeared to me. An angel appeared to me and said, this is a, a God, this is the gospel. How many of you know that the devil, the Bible says the devil disguises himself as an angel of light? Remember, what, remember the story of the ten virgins, the five wise and the five foolish? What did the five foolish say when they tried to get in with no oil in their lamp? But we performed all these miraculous signs. We should get in because in your name we did this and we did that and we, we, we performed healing. We did these supernatural signs. And what does the bridegroom say? What does Jesus say? I never knew you. But... Miraculous signs accompanying my mirror. An angel appeared. Let me, let me give you some homework. Do a little study of, of false religious systems in the world today. How many of them were given by angelic beings? Islam. Muhammad received the Quran from an angel of God. Mormonism, the the angel Moroni came to Joseph Smith and gave him another testament. How many religious systems have come as a result of angelic dictation? It's like Paul knew, even if an angel, and there's going to be a lot of them, (laughs) but an angel told me. No, Historic Christianity does not change. 
even in the face. Do you know, let me just say this, and then I'll move on quickly from this. In the book of Revelation, the Bible tells us that, and I believe the rapture will have taken place and we'll be all be gone by then, but in the last three and a half years of the great tribulation, the Antichrist is going to come, and the Bible tells us he's going to do miraculous signs. And through that, he's going to actually appear to have risen from the dead. He's going to deceive many people with his supernatural, how do you know, the devil can do supernatural things. He doesn't have the supernatural power of God, but he can make it seem like he can. It's like, I hear this all the time. Pastor Barry, I consulted, I consulted with a psychic, and they told me, back it up, What? Yeah, it was a miracle. She told me stuff there's no way she could have known. You wouldn't believe how accurate my astrology was today. It said, because I'm a Leo, that I was going to meet someone today. Oh, really? Supernatural. Paul said, "Uh, so what? It's not the gospel. Even if an angel appears to you and contradicts what we originally taught you, they're under God's curse. Can it get worse than that? <laughs> let me, and then Paul said, and just in case you didn't hear it the first time, let me say it again. They're cursed. They're cursed. They're under a curse. Okay. Number four. Why must it be held firmly? Number four, another gospel results in God's curse. There you go. Verse nine, as we've said it already, now I'll say it again. If anybody's preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Why should we, be held, why should we hold it firmly? Because another gospel results in God's curse. Number five, last one, a distorted gospel is often the result of people pleasing. This, this one, when I saw it, it blew me away. Look at verse 10. Paul says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? In other words, what Paul's saying is if I was a people pleaser and if I wanted to please people, I surely wouldn't present this gospel. I'd present one that would tickle your ears and make you feel like you could do things you never, you know, you never could do before. Behaviors that maybe previously were bad, now they're okay. Paul says, if I was a people pleaser, if I was trying to please please people, I'd preach a different gospel. See, a distorted gospel is often the result of people pleasing. See, listen, the true gospel pleases God, not man. Progressive Christianity is, is changing the gospel to please themselves. They want to practice things that God has historically disallowed. So guess what we do? Let's just redefine it. Let's bring in some other teachings. Let's relegate the teachings of Jesus as just one pathway to God. This is why it must be held firmly. Last question. How do we practice it? Practical application. What's the gospel? We've learned what that is, why we must hold it firmly. Now help us, Pastor Barry, give us some some instructions of how can we practice the gospel in a reliably, biblically reliable way. And let me quickly go through some ways, okay? Number one, this is what you can do. Number one, prioritize the gospel. Put first things first. That's how you practice the gospel. Put first things first. Paul said this is a first priority. See, not everything in the Bible is of equal importance. That's the first thing we must realize. It's all God's word, but some of it Jesus fulfilled. Some of it we are no longer bound to. So put those things of first importance first. The gospel is of first importance. Listen. Listen to me. Don't die on every hill in the Bible. I said it last week. It bears repeat, repeating this week. Some beliefs we talk over. 
you know, no, I'm not sure I believe that, you know, blah, 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 blah. Let's talk it over. Let's debate it a little bit. Let's talk it. Let's, let's have another discussion. on Some beliefs we talk over. Some beliefs we fight over. They're a little bit more important, so we're willing to pick it up a little bit, kick it up a notch, argue it more vehemently on some beliefs we die over. They're of first importance importance. Put first things first, and the gospel is a belief to die over. We get this wrong, we're under a curse. A lot of things, man, a lot of things you can argue with me over. Baptism, oh, let's go, you know. Um, Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. Let's argue. Let's Let's discuss it. I'm not willing to die on that hill. But the gospel? This is one to die over. This is of first importance. Put first things first. Number two, the second thing we can do to to practice the gospel is to commemorate and celebrate the gospel at every baptism and communion service. Every time we witness a baptism, every time we participate, every time we take communion, we commemorate and celebrate the gospel. It's true. Let me, when, when we water baptize, it's a big deal. It's such a big deal. It's a, it's a reenactment of the gospel. Going under the water symbolizes our death to sin through Christ's death. Coming out of the water symbolizes our resurrection to new life in Christ through his physical resurrection. That's a celebration of the gospel. And we should clap every time. And we should congratulate everyone when they come out with their hair wet and they're thinking, what just happened to me? Yay, good for you. We celebrate the new life in Christ that the old is gone, the new has come. That's the gospel. I know we take communion once a month, and I know I can hear it, and some of you who told me, I can't get this little kid, I can't get it open. <laughs> right? <laughs> I see you should start earlier. <laughs> Pretty soon we're so mad at the communion emblems, we're just ready to, oh. <laughs> I know. Maybe soon we'll be back to the other ones, I don't know. Don't get distracted by this. We, ce- we celebrate communion once a month. Why? Because we want to commemorate and we want to celebrate the gospel. And every time, listen to me, when we take communion, it's a big deal. It's so big that Paul says if we do it wrong, we could bring sickness and premature death on ourselves. That's 1 Corinthians 11. Go read it. It'll blow your mind. When we eat the bread... It proclaims his death as a substitutionary death for us. When we drink the cup, it proclaims his death as payment for our sins. We celebrate the gospel every time we take communion. Oh, I wish we'd just hurry up and get this over with. No! We celebrate. We celebrate the gospel. Number three, musicians, come. We're going to close the service. The third thing we can do to practice the gospel is guard the gospel with biblical discernment. Guard the gospel with biblical discernment. Listen, learn how to lovingly confront those who distort and pervert the gospel. We're commanded to defend the faith. We're commanded, listen to me, look at me, we're commanded not to have fellowship with somebody who comes in the church and practices immorality and still thinks that they're okay. The Bible says don't even sit down to eat with them. We need to lovingly confront people with the truth who distort the gospel. Pick your battles. Like I said before, don't argue over denominational differences, but it is okay to disagree with doctrinal defects and false teachings, and the Bible commands us to call them out. Oh, but they're such a, listen, (laughs) they're such a good person. 
A good person doesn't guarantee a good doctrine. We, if we listen, if we accept, eh, pretty soon, what we believe is another gospel, which is no gospel at all. Remember, moral teaching creates better behavior, but only the gospel creates total transformation. Guard the gospel with biblical discernment. We have to be willing, if not, if not personally, we must be willing to say that concept is false teaching and I reject it and I have no fellowship with it. Guard the gospel with biblical discernment. And finally, number four, share the gospel at every opportunity. Share the gospel at every opportunity. Those who teach a different gospel are, listen to me, they're under a curse, and that curse will result in their eternal damnation. I'm sorry to say it, but it is incumbent upon us to warn those who have departed from the faith or those who have never accepted the gospel of salvation, it's up to us to share the gospel. The Bible says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, and then the end will come. Can I just tell you something? <laughs> the Bible teaches us that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And that's the truth of the gospel. And you know it's not popular. And you know people don't want to hear about hell. But it's our job to warn people. Why? Because when they stand before the judgment seat of Christ, they don't, you don't want them to look at us and say, you never warned me. You, should, you, you warn people and they, they make fun of you. They shame you. They mock you. Oh, that's fine. But when they stand before the judgment seat of Christ, listen to me. They can't say, you never told me, you never warned me. And can I just tell you something? Listen to me. It, sometimes it's as simple as inviting someone to church. And, and let me pledge this to you. As long as I'm the pastor here, I will present the gospel from this pulpit, a biblical gospel. And so you say, well, Pastor, I don't know all the ins and outs of the gospel. Well, you know what? Invite somebody to church. They'll hear the gospel. We'll give them an opportunity to respond in faith by grace to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And why wouldn't we? People are going to go to hell. Oh, Pastor Barry, don't talk about hell. You know why I'm hurrying up through this series? Because I don't want to be talking about hell at Christmas time. part of the gospel. We're under a curse if we... So let me conclude with some questions real quick. Have you, have your sins been forgiven? Have you received the grace of God by faith? Or are you still trying to be good enough be moral, trying to be better behaved. See, you must respond to the gospel. You can either accept it and be saved or change it and be cursed. There's no other option. Look at me for a second. Hanging around is not good enough. I'm hearing a lot. But have you responded in faith to the gospel? That's key. And I want, I want to give you that opportunity this morning. In just a minute, we're going to pray, and I'm going to ask elders and prayer partners to come. And maybe, and I'm not going to embarrass you in front of everyone, but I want, I want to just say, if you've never had your sins forgiven, if you've never received the gift of salvation by faith, through grace, by grace, through faith, Today's your opportunity. All you have to do is stand in front of one of these elders and say, 
can you help me get forgiveness of my sins? And the answer is yes, we can do it right here, right now, and we will. You have to respond to the gospel. Every single one of you in this room, every single one of you watching the stream today, you have to respond to the grace of God, to the gospel. There's no other option. Stand with me if you would this morning and ask those prayer partners if they would come. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you have offered forgiveness and redemption in the gospel. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Thank you, Jesus, for dying in my place and paying the penalty for my sin. I repent, O oh God, for deserting the gospel you prophesied in the Old Testament. We repent of trying to change the gospel, making it no gospel at all. Forgive us for thinking that we can improve or expand on your gospel. Forgive us for our pride and our arrogance. We humble ourselves before you. We acknowledge you, Jesus, as the only way to God and the only way to heaven. Help us to commemorate and celebrate the gospel at every baptism and every communion service. Help us to guard and defend the gospel with discernment. Give us the courage to share the gospel at every opportunity. And it is this we pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.